For much of the public discussion about AUKUS, submarines dominate the headlines. Nuclear propulsion, Virginia-class stopgaps, cost overruns, and political fights have shaped the narrative. But if you step back and look at the maritime environment of the Indo-Pacific, submarines are only one part of a larger equation. Equally critical is the ability to keep fleets alive against the growing threats from drones, cruise missiles, and potentially hypersonic weapons. For that purpose, radar and air defense missiles are the real shield, and here the United Kingdom and Australia may be building a quieter but equally important partnership, Sea Scepter and Sea Far. The Royal Navy has for decades invested in layered air defense. Its crown jewels are the six Type 45 destroyers armed with the Sea Viper system, combining the Samson multifunction radar with the Aster family of missiles. These ships were designed for high-end fleet defense, and they have demonstrated capability in real combat, shooting down drones in the Red Sea in recent years. But the UK has not stopped there. To complement its destroyers, it has rolled out the Sea Scepter missile, also known as the Common Anti-Air Modular Missile, SIAM. Installed on Type 23 frigates and soon to be the primary weapon of the new Type 26 and Type 31 classes, Sea Scepter represents a new philosophy, an affordable, all-rounder point and local area defense missile designed to be fired in salvos, cold launch from compact canisters, and flexible enough to be deployed across land, sea, and even air platforms. This shift in philosophy matters because modern naval threats are not just supersonic bombers launching waves of heavy missiles. Increasingly, they are low-flying cruise missiles, swarms of drones, or cheap but dangerous loitering munitions. Aster 30 may be overkill against such targets, while also too expensive to be used in large volumes. Sea Scepter is intended to fill that middle layer providing a cost-effective shield against saturation attacks. By adopting a modular soft launch design, CAM does not require large launch cells or hot exhaust handling, making it easy to integrate into many different ships. On the Australian side, the story has been different but complementary. Australia's Royal Navy has relied heavily on American weapons, particularly the standard missile family and the Evolve Sea Sparrow. Its Hobart-class destroyers carry the Aegis combat system, and its upgraded Anzac-class frigates have been given new capabilities. But the real distinctive feature of Australian naval modernization is not imported missiles, but rather homegrown radar. The CAFAR family, developed by CEA Technologies, represents one of the most advanced active phased array naval radars in the world. By producing their own radar suite, Australia has carved out a rare niche of technological sovereignty, ensuring that at least one part of its combat system is not dependent on foreign suppliers. CAFAR has been progressively upgraded and will be the defining sensor on the upcoming Hunter-class frigates, themselves based on the British Type 26. Here is where the intersection occurs. Britain exports the ship design but Australia replaces key elements such as the radar. Instead of Artisan, the UK's medium-range radar, the Australians will mount CAFAR, integrated into their own combat architecture. Yet the question then arises, what missile family should be paired with it? America's ESSM and SM2 are standard, but they are expensive and limited in availability. Sea Scepter could be a logical complement especially for the middle tier of defense. This is more than just a technical integration problem. Strategically, if Canberra adopts Sea Scepter for its hunter class or other ships, it would deepen the industrial and military bond with Britain beyond just ship blueprints. It would make the Royal Navy and the Royal Australian Navy more interoperable at the tactical level. A task force with hunters and Type 26s could share logistics and training for the same missile family. 
The missile's data link flexibility means that it can work with different radars, and CEAFAR's high power and digital beam forming make it well suited to guiding a variety of interceptors. The synergy is obvious. An Australian radar and a British missile could together form the basis of a layered defense shield in the Indo-Pacific. From Britain's perspective, this would be extremely welcome. The UK faces the challenge of keeping its missile production lines busy and securing export markets for Sea Scepter. Selling to Australia, and perhaps integrating with CE FAR, would extend the system's life, reduce costs per unit, and strengthen BAE Systems' role as the prime contractor. From Australia's side, the benefit would be a reliable and relatively low-cost missile that can be bought in larger numbers than SM-2 or SM-6. In a real crisis, quantity matters. A hunter-class frigate might face dozens of inbound threats. Having hundreds of sea scepters aboard could make the difference between survival and saturation. This does not mean the path is straightforward. Technically, integration takes time and money. CFAR is not part of the NATO standard ecosystem, and while CAM is modular, any integration requires testing and certification. Politically, there may be friction with the United States, which naturally wants Australia to remain tied to its missile supply chain. Washington has already invested in ensuring allies standardize on its weapons, and a shift towards British missiles could be viewed with suspicion. Strategically, Sea Scepter is not a replacement for long-range interceptors. Australia will still need SM-2 or SM-6 to deal with aircraft and long-range missile threats. KAMM is a supplement, not a substitute. Yet the potential is clear. If hunters deploy CFAR and CAM together, the Royal Australian Navy would possess a truly unique blend. A sovereign radar, a diversified missile suite, and an export link back to Britain. In effect, it would create a small but resilient AUKUS air defense architecture, complementing the submarine pillar with a shield against the skies. It would also showcase that AUKUS is not just about nuclear propulsion or trilateral deals, but about a deeper technological integration across multiple layers of military capability. For London, the prospect of Australian adoption of Sea Scepter would reinforce its role in the Pacific, even if the Royal Navy can only deploy a carrier strike group every few years. It would mean that its missile technology sails permanently in the region, under an Australian flag. For Canberra, the value would be the ability to defend its fleets more cheaply and in greater volume, ensuring that its warships are not sitting ducks in a region where drone and missile threats are proliferating. The broader question is whether such cooperation can scale. Could Britain and Australia jointly evolve a next-generation missile, perhaps building on CAM-ER or a derivative optimized for CFAR? Could the two countries coordinate procurement to reduce unit costs? And how would the United States respond if a core AUKUS partner started fielding a non-American missile in significant numbers? These are open questions but they point to a future where the naval link between Britain and Australia extends well beyond submarines. In the end, while the media continues to chase the headline stories of cost overruns on nuclear boats, a quieter story is unfolding. Sea Scepter and Sea Far may be the next real test of Anglo-Australian defense integration. The answer will determine whether AUKUS is just about one weapon system, or whether it truly represents a broader military and industrial partnership. And that leads us to the final question. If submarines are the sword of AUKUS, will Sea Scepter and Sea Far be its shield?